commanded to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And the psalmist wrote devotedly, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. So I found it particularly compelling when the influential contemporary religious scholar, D.P. Walker, pointed out Here we go. When he pointed out that the normative Christian conception of eternity is seriously lacking aesthetically. It exhibits, he says, arbitrary and asymmetrical features. He writes, Christians are perhaps at a real disadvantage in having two eternities, the heaven and hell inhabited by humans, which have a beginning but no end. Why not? an eternitas aparte ante, instead of post. In other words, why not beings who have no beginning, but an end? Or why not both? Or why not a successive eternity with neither beginning nor end? He says, to anyone thinking in platonic terms, the eternity without end would seem highly paradoxical. It's truncated, lopsided, and would be absurdly inadequate to an image of the ideal still eternity. The Christian scheme is untidy and inelegant. But then he goes on to discuss the resurrection of the idea of pre-existence in Platonic terms in the 17th century. And he said it was aesthetics that played an important part. And he says this quite approvingly. The problem with conventional Christian models may be aesthetic, but their implications are logically troubling as well. For the orthodox rendering of an asymmetrical eternity retains, he writes, a disadvantage common to all Christian schemes as compared with the Neoplatonic one. It leads to the basic unanswerable question, why did God create it all? In the Platonic scheme, he says, the question never arises. So what we have is this beautifully elegant continuous eternity, there is a temporary descent into mortality, a time of probation, and then a reascent back into the stream of eternity. Beautiful, lovely, and entirely intuitive, he writes. The primary impetus behind pre-existence, as far as I can make out, is, is certainly not aesthetics. It's not the shadowy intimations of a Wordsworth or the epistemological quandaries of a Plato. Plato comes to the problem largely by asking the question, how is it that we know things that we shouldn't know? And pre-existence provides an answer. The most compelling impetus behind the idea seems to be the drive for theodicy, right? Theodicy, by which is meant the attempt to, to make sense of the justice of God, given the conditions of mortality we see. Even Plato himself argued in the Republic that the pre-mortality of a soul endowed with choice means we cannot blame God for our mortal condition. Origen's famous espousal of preexistence was absolutely predicated on the conception of a human fall that we all participate in. He, and uh, St. Augustine, as we saw, also found this a powerful attraction. But the most radical and influential resurrection of both theodicy and preexistence occurs in the 19th century, not at the hands of Joseph Smith, but by a man who was at one time the most promising member of the mid-19th century's most prominent American family, the Beechers. His father, Lyman, and his brother, Charles, were commanding figures in that era, probably the two most popular, famous, influential preachers of the era. One sister achieved fame as a suffragist, the other as the little lady who started a war, Harriet Beecher Stowe. But it was Edward, who some family members thought had the most promise. Why hasn't anybody heard of Edward Beecher? Well, the explanation is succinct and poignant and it's given by a descendant as he handed over to Illinois State College Library a manuscript life of Edward Beecher, and he attached this note. I am about to send on to you the last manuscript, Life of Edward Beecher, by his brother Charles. It is none too rich in human interest, perhaps being concerned overwhelmingly with Edward's spiritual development and his belief in the preexistence of the soul an unfortunate excursion into the realms of heresy, which apparently wrecked his career. And then he, then he adds this thought. He said, Edward Beecher apparently became obsessed with the idea and developed the delusion that he was born to be the Copernicus of morals. Well, he ended up being the Galileo instead. 
but his impassioned critique of Christian notions of depravity, of original sin, and of God's tyrannical caprice, caprice is a moving testament, I think, to the better nature of so many people in that age of reform. That Joseph Smith came to similar conclusions through prophecy rather than theology may deprive us of an appreciation for the majesty of the doctrine's moral power and of the philosophical and theological bases that people like Edward Beecher have erected under it. Beecher recorded this struggle he had with God. Pain, sickness, and death come to the human race antecedent to the development of reason. Such a constitution resembles punishment. But calling total depravity voluntary is like removing a difficulty by language only. In short, original, native, entire depravity is a hard doctrine to be explained. The question is, is not the present Christian system a malevolent one? This spoken by, as I said, a, a preacher and son of the most influential preachers of the mid-19th century. We cannot analyze the thing, he said. He continued to seek a resolution, and when he found it, it came as a virtual revelation. After his figurative groping, as his brother wrote, in some vast cathedral in the gloom of midnight, vainly striving to comprehend its parts and relations, when suddenly before the vast arched window of the nave, a glorious sun suddenly burst forth. What happened, in other words, was that Edward Beecher had a vision. He had an epiphany. It was a shattering epiphany that he wanted to share at once with his congregation and the world, but his cautious father urged restraint, saying it would wreck his career. Beecher kept the revelation to himself for a quarter of a century. Then he threw caution to the wind and issued a 400-page manifesto, the boldest and most detailed exposition of the doctrine of preexistence in religious history. Why haven't we heard of it? It was published in 1853 and called Conflict of Ages, or the Great Debate on the Moral Relations of God and Man. In it, he boldly asserted, God in the beginning created a race of spirit beings. These he constituted free agents and dealt by them in all things justly and honorably. His book landed like a, bom a bombshell. Most amazingly, reviewers almost universally agreed, quote, it presents the scriptural doctrine concerning the kingdom of fallen spirits in a light that is rational, intelligible, and impressive. Another reviewer wrote, Dr. Beecher's Conflict of Ages has been honored with a remarkable degree of attention. It has been reviewed and re-reviewed in newspapers, magazines, courses of lectures, in book form. It seems to have come down on pulpit and religious press like rain upon mown grass, as showers that water the earth in time of drought. The crop has been abundant. Still, the weight of tradition and prejudice overwhelmed both the book and the man. The philosopher Immanuel Kant seems to have been the first to find this unique argument in favor of preexistence. He felt that there was a startling incongruity between the triviality, the banality, and the utter contingency of circumstances under which most human life is conceived and the product thereby engendered, which is something majestic, touched with divinity and endowed with immortality. He wrote, the contingency of conception depends upon opportunity. But besides this on nourishment, government, moods, caprices, or as we would say today, hormones, even on vices, it presents a great difficulty for the opinion that the soul has eternal duration if it came into existence under circumstances so trivial. Or as he will conclude with gentle understatement, it certainly seems questionable to expect such a powerful effect from such inconsequential causes. Against this, however, you could propose a transcendental hypothesis, he wrote, that all has neither begun at birth nor will end through death. That if we could intuit the things and ourselves as they are, we would see ourselves in a world of spirit natures with which our only true community had not begun with birth. The Russian philosopher Nikolai Berdayev, likewise, he was early 20th century, likewise found preexistence a powerful remedy to alternative anthropologies that deprive the human soul of its due dignity. Protestantism, he says, was bound to make its appearance because there existed in the history of Christianity no positive religious anthropology. But 
even this vacancy was filled by a false answer.